If you want to stand up, I'm going to read the Bible, and then we're going to worship together, so you can stand up if you want. Also, uh, we just want to welcome you. It's like, you know, a different thing between just being present somewhere and being welcome. So we just want to say welcome, and welcome so much. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I think welcome so much. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, if you want to come up to the front and worship or spread out or take some extra space or anything, feel free to do that. But I'm going to read this scripture from First Peter. And Bible says this, 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 6. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him, even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Um, I think that pretty much speaks for itself. I don't know if I want you to say anything about it. So I'm just going to pray, and then we're going to worship together, okay? Um, Lord, we love you. And we look forward to the day that you come back and you're revealed to us face to face. That we love you even though we've never seen you. And though we don't see you now, we trust you. And we rejoice in your presence. So, Father, I pray that as we sing and as we pray and uh, as we worship, as we as we talk and hang out, hang out and spend time together, listen to the preaching of the scriptures, God, I just um, I pray that you just meet us here, that you like what you hear, that you like what you see from us, God, and that you would just draw near to us because we draw near to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
exactly that, God. We take everything that's happened this week and what's happened from the week before and the week before that, God. We take all of our pain, all of our hurt, all of our struggle, the things that our, our, that our hearts ache for, God. We take that along with the joy and the victory that you've been pouring out, that you've been blessing us with, the doors that you've been opening, God. We take all of that and we give that back to you, God. We empty our hearts and we ready our souls for the message this night, your word, God. May our hearts and minds be open to the message. May your spirit reside here in this room. Not just in this room, God, but in the, the homes and the places of everyone watching online tonight, God. May your spirit do what it is intended to do tonight. And may we leave this place changed. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys can have a seat. Um, and just as Ben said, however you are, um, whatever you're bringing into this place, we're glad you're here. Welcome to church for those of you guys in person, those of you guys online. Um, it's good to be with you tonight. Um, this is why we gather. We gather as the people of God to be in the presence of God because we believe that God is truly alive and active and on the move. And we get to participate in that heaven coming to earth through learning more about him through his word and worshiping him because he's so worthy. So we're glad to be with you. Thank you for choosing to be here on a Thursday night. Uh, before we dive into service, there's a few things that we just want to bring you guys in on. Um, the first, as always, is a thank you. Thank you guys who have been giving. Um, we look to the scriptures where it says that where our treasures, our heart follows, our resources matter to God because they come from God. Um, so if you guys are ever interested in giving to this church, this is your home church community, you can go online to calvarywestlake.org backslash give. Um, there are many ways to give. If you guys have questions about that or where the money goes, please talk to us. We'd love to have that conversation. Um, another way that we invite and encourage you guys to participate each week is through prayer. Um, tonight, there's many different ways uh, you can get involved in prayer team, but tonight I really just want to highlight that we have people in the back by the prayer wall. Um, I'll be there, Pastor Aaron Kanjuma, my friend Callie. If you guys feel comfortable receiving in-person prayer along with putting prayer requests on the wall, we'd be happy to do that. We just want to create a culture, whether it's us, your neighbor, um, someone, the person next to you just asking for prayer because as the people of God were told in James 5 that the prayer of the righteous, it's powerful and effective. It is our first defense. It is our best defense. So we are a people of prayer here and we'd love to engage with you in that way. Um, our last and final announcement, we were talking about this last week, but we're starting up small groups again. Uh, give me a shout if you're in a small group or you just love small groups. We're, okay, all right, we can do better than that. <laughs> I'm in a small group, and I, I can speak and say that. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing place to get to know people deeper as you study the Word of God on a new level, as you pray together and really do life together. Um, if you're interested in joining a men's group, women's group, college group, young professionals group, we even have co-ed groups this year, um, you can go to our website, calvarywestlake.org backslash young dash adults, or go to the link in our Instagram. Um, it has a form there, super easy to fill out. I'll contact you, get you plugged in. Um, but we just really value that, that sort of community. So if you have questions, find me after service. We'd love to talk more. Um, but yeah, that's it for announcements. Uh, before we d dive back into the message, um, Jesus said to his followers that he would be known by our love for one another. And in order to do that, we need to get to know each other. So we're going to put three minutes on the clock. This is mingle time. Go find someone you don't know or maybe know just a little bit and ask them a quality question. All right, go ahead.
All right, good evening, church. As you grab your seat, go ahead and grab a Bible while you do. If you got it, go ahead and head over to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. If you didn't join us last week, we kicked off a, uh, a three week teaching series here on this minor prophet, this Old Testament prophet of Habakkuk. And if you don't know where that is, you can turn to the table of contents in your Bible, jump right over to it. I want to encourage you, if you missed last week, uh, check out the podcast, the YouTube video, get a sense for what this book is all about. But before we jump into tonight, we just want you to hear a few of the words of Habakkuk chapter 2, so I'll send it over to AJ to read our scripture for tonight. All right, so excited. Well, hey, if you could do me a favor uh, in person or online, can you stand up for me while we read God's word? It's going to be so good, so good. All right, Habakkuk chapter 2. I will go to the lookout tower. I'll station myself on the city wall. I'll wait to see how the Lord will reply to me. Then I'll try to figure out how to answer him. The Lord replies, write down the message I'm showing you in a vision. Write it clearly on the tablets you use. Then a messenger can read it and run to announce it. The message I give you waits for the time I have appointed. It speaks about what's going to happen and all of it will come true. It may take a while, but wait for it. You can be sure it will come. It will happen when I want it to. You may be seated. Very good. Yeah, thank you, AJ. <clears throat> if you remember from last week, we said the minor prophets help us answer some questions. Uh, among three of the questions we said the minor prophets help us answer is this very simple question. This simple question, what does God care about? The, the question that the minor prophets help us consider and think through and, and ponder is this question, what does God care about? It, it's a little bit in the same way, like if I were to go on one of your social media accounts, uh, of whatever you're using these days, if I were to look at that social media account, I would quickly be able to discover what you care about. Uh, if you to posted about your family or posted about your job or about your church, if you posted about cars or about movies or about fitness or about sports, I would be able to tell very quickly what it is you care about. What we're doing when we read the Bible and what we're doing when we read the Minor Prophets is we're trying to see what issues come up over and over and over again. Because when we do, we can start to understand not only who our God is, but what our God cares about, what he is passionate about. And tonight, I don't want you to see this in Habakkuk chapter 2, because I think we're going to understand what God is passionate about. It says in chapter 2 and verse 2, these words, it says, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that the herald may run with it. Well, like in other words, here's what God wants Habakkuk to do. Write it down. Make it plain on tablets, which is like their version of paper, right? Their version of distributing information so that a herald may run with it. In other words, what God is trying to do for Habakkuk here is not give some kind of incomprehensible religious language that no one really understands. What God is doing for Habakkuk is he's trying to give a very clear and a very simple message. And here's what I want us to understand, that when we read the Bible, we see that very clear and simple message that's given to us. Like, let me put it to you this way tonight, that the message of the Bible is clear, and it demands a response. And tonight, what I want to present to you is the message of the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk. And I believe the message of the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk is clear. It tells us what God cares about, and it demands a response from us. I believe there's some language here that you may struggle to understand fully and completely, but the message, the central point is clear and it demands a response. If you think about it, there are certain messages that you receive in life that don't really demand a response. When you're hanging out somewhere and your friend texts you, I'm on my way, that doesn't really demand a response, right? It's just information for you. Or from time to time, I'll get an email and in the subject line, it'll say FYI, and then it'll tell me something. That's an email that I don't need to respond to. It demands no response. But then there are other kinds of messages you receive in life that do demand a response, that insist that you do something about it. If someone ran into this building and screamed, the building is on fire, that's not just something you go, huh, all right, cool, where? You know, like you, you, you respond to that. Or if you got a little letter in the mail that said you have jury duty, you don't just look at it and go, interesting, and then toss it, right? You put it on your calendar because it demands a response. 
And in the case of this building being on fire or you getting called to jury duty, you can choose to not respond to it. You can choose to say no to it. Like if I say the building is on fire, you all need to leave and you decide I'm good, I'm sticking it out. You can do that. It's just gonna have consequences for you, right? Like charred consequences for you, like that's gonna happen. Or if you get a jury duty summons and you just decide, I know I have jury duty, I just don't wanna go. You can make that decision. But that decision is a response and it's going to have consequences. And I want you to know that when it comes to the message of the Bible, it's not like those first examples. The Bible's not giving you FYIs about God. It's not like, just so you know, God cares about these things. It's the second kind of example. When the Bible gives a message, it is the type of message that demands a response. And what I want to call all of us to tonight is to have this kind of spirit and attitude that when we hear the word of God speak, we respond to that. That we would never just be a people who just kind of hear the word of God or hear what God has to say and just kind of go, that's interesting information and move along with our lives. Like tonight, I want you to know you're going to hear about what God cares about. Three things we're going to see in this text that God is passionate about, that he cares about, and that he wants from your life. And there is no way to hear this message and not respond. Because you can hear what God cares about tonight and just decide that that doesn't really matter to your life. And that is a response. Or tonight you can hear what God cares about, and you can respond with faith and obedience. And that's the response God is after. And in fact, tonight I want to go so far as to say this. Tonight I'm going to give some of you an opportunity to respond to the very center of the gospel message, that God came into this world to save sinners, to redeem sinners, that you might have a relationship with God, that you might be saved. Tonight, I'm gonna give an invitation for some of you to put your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time, to respond to the good news of Jesus, because it is a message that demands a response. I want you to see how this response comes to us, and I want you to see what that message is tonight when it comes to the structure of the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk. The second chapter of the book of Habakkuk is going to bring judgment upon the nation of Babylon. If you remember last week, God is going to use Babylon to judge the nation of Israel, or better said, to to judge Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. But then the second chapter, what God's going to say is, just because I'm judging you, doesn't mean I'm not going to bring judgment on Babylon, this wicked and destructive nation. So the whole second chapter is set up in this framework of this, these five woes of Habakkuk chapter two. We're gonna see this five different times. If you read through the text of Habakkuk chapter two, you're going to see the word woe five times. Now I want you to know what the word woe means because we don't really use that word, okay? Like there's never a moment where you say woe in the way the Bible uses it. You might be like, woe, but not how the Bible says it. Here's what the Bible is. A woe is an announcement of God's judgment on sinners, So when the Bible says, woe to this person, it is an announcement that God is judging this person for their sin, for their rebellion, for their lack of response to his commands. I want you to know that what we're going to see here is these five woes against Babylon, these five things that God is passionate about, that God cares about. And then I'm going to say a sentence that might actually bother some of you. I want you to know that the woes of the Bible teach us what God hates. I want you to know that God hates certain things. And that's going to bother some of you because you've just so imbibed the idea that God is love. And you're convinced that if God is love, he can't possibly hate anything. But I want you to know the exact opposite is true. And if you think about it for a moment, you'll realize it. If God is love, he must hate certain things. I can tell you this, I'm not a perfect dad. I make mistakes. I'm a sinner. I fall short all the time. But I love my kids. Like I love them to the core of my being. And because I love my kids, there are certain things I hate. Because I love my kids, I hate the fact that they could get sick with a debilitating disease that would cause them harm and suffering. I hate that. Because I love my kids, I hate the very idea that someone would abuse them or harm them or manipulate them or shame them. So because I love my kids so much, there needs to be things in this world I hate. Because of my love for my kids, there are things that I absolutely hate that have happened to them or will happen to them. And I need you to understand the same is true with God. That because God loves you, because God is for you, because God loves his people, and because God loves human beings in general, God 
has to hate certain things. The author Tim Chalice puts it this way. I want you to hear these words. He says, the God who loves what is good must not love what is evil. He goes on to say, he must not even be ambivalent toward what is evil, what is harmful, and what is destructive. He must hate it. The God of the Bible reveals himself as a God of love, but he also reveals himself as a God who hates. I want you to know that in order to love something or someone, you must hate that which would bring it destruction. You must bring, hate that which would bring it harm. It's not that God hates people. It's that there are things God hates. And in the midst of these five woes, I want to show you these five woes tonight. And I want to show you three things that I believe they're telling us that God hates. This is the clear message of Habakkuk 2. And it demands a response from us. I want to show you these first three woes in Habakkuk 2. In verse 6, it says this. Woe to him who piles up uh, stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. So the first woe, the first judgment God is putting on is the type of person who steals goods for themselves and makes themselves wealthy through extortion. This is not and never is a condemnation of wealth itself, but rather by wealth brought by illegal or immoral means. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 9 says, Woe to him who builds a house by unjust gain. In other words, woe to the person who unjustly accumulates resources so they can make their life, their family, their situation more comfortable. Finally, verse 12 says this, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by justice or injustice. Like in other words, What's being recognized here in Habakkuk chapter 2 is that there are things that we can do that are wicked, unjust things we can do as individuals. But then there's also in this verse an implication that there's someone who can build a city or build a town with unjust practices like bloodshed. It's built with injustice. And here's what I want all of us to be extraordinarily clear on tonight. It's taught in Habakkuk chapter 2 and throughout the whole Bible. I want you to know that God hates injustice. God hates injustice. He hates it. He despises it. God's face is set against injustice. Because God is a God of love, because God loves you, God hates injustice. And I want you to know what the response is that is demanded from the fact that God hates injustice. It's that God calls his people to respond to injustice with justice. With justice. This is the message. God hates injustice. What does God care about? He cares about people. And because he cares about people and because he loves people, injustice is an offense to his heart and he hates it. And the call of God on your life that demands a response, you can respond or not, but either way, you're responding to it. The call of God on your life is to care about justice. Now, now when the Bible uses justice, there are a bunch of Greek and Hebrew words that it's going to use, but all of them point toward this idea of people being treated equally, of people having dignity and value and worth, of rights being afforded to people. All of these things that we think are such modern ideas are found in the scripture. The Bible doesn't use qualifying words like social justice or racial justice or economic justice. And I'm not saying those are wrong to use. I'm just saying the Bible doesn't use those words. It just uses the word justice. And here's what I want to say to you tonight. I've said some of this before, but I want to repeat it again. I want you to know that justice is not a modern thing. Sometimes there floats around this idea that there was oppression and injustice and terrible things happening all over the world for all of human history. And then like a hundred years ago, humans decided to start caring about doing the right thing. And I want you to know if that's your view of history, that is ignorant of how history actually worked. And more importantly, it is ignorant of the impulse that God put inside of us for the just thing to happen. Justice is not a modern thing. It didn't show up five minutes ago. And it's not defined by the modern debates we have here in 2021 about justice and what that looks like in the United States of America. It is a universal thing. It is a historical thing. This angst toward justice is as old as humanity itself. Number one, justice is not a modern thing. Number two, I want you to know justice is not a liberal thing. Let let me speak to you tonight. Let me speak to you tonight if you consider yourself conservative. Online or in this room. There is a temptation whenever a church talks about justice in our current climate, in our current culture, To think that because justice is being brought up, 
This is some kind of capitulation to a political movement, a political party, a political platform that the church has gone woke or bought into some other thing. And I want you to know that that belief is not aligned with the Bible. I want you to understand this, that if you are a conservative and you have forsaken the idea of justice because there's people on the other side who disagree with you, who use that same word, you have forsaken an essential biblical word. Justice is not optional for us. Justice is not a liberal thing. The Democratic Party didn't come up with it. It didn't come up in the last five minutes. Justice is this deeply biblical thing. If you are a conservative, I just want to plead with you. You may have a different vision of how that plays out in this country, and praise God, keep arguing for it. But listen to me. It's not a liberal thing that you just get to dismiss because you've grown up more conservative. Listen, justice is not a modern thing. It is not a liberal thing. Can we be clear in this room tonight? Justice is a Bible thing. It's a Bible thing. And if we are going to be Bible-believing Christians who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, who believe that the Bible is the final authority for Christians, we are going to have to care about justice. We're going to have to talk about justice and care about justice and define what justice looks like in each situation. And again, if your word justice has gotten so wrapped up in the United States of America, I'm just going to plead with you when this pandemic's over, get on a plane and fly somewhere else in the world, okay? Okay. The United States of America isn't the world. And there are problems here. We've got to work through those problems and talk about those things. But I want you to know justice is this global, historical thing that we as the people of God are called to care about. Why? Because it's something our God cares about. This is the message that demands a response. God cares about justice. Will you? Are you going to care about it? Are you going to talk about it? Are you going to put your life toward it and care about this thing that God calls justice? Hear me on this. Justice is an essential word that we discard at our peril, that we discard at our peril. God cares about justice, justice on the individual level, justice on the societal level. God cares that the right things be done, that those who are widows and orphans, those who are poor and those who are hungry, the Bible talks about immigrants and foreigners, those who are from different lands. The Bible talks about us caring about them. And this isn't some political movement. I'm not trying to move the church towards some platform. I just want to say that if you're going to care about the Bible, you need to care about justice. This is something God cares about. Again, justice is a biblical word. It's an essential word. And we jettison it. We ignore it. We push it to the side, to our peril. It goes on this way in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15. Again, this is the fourth of the five woes that we're going to look at tonight. The fourth of the five woes says this. It says, Woe to him who gives drinks to his neighbor, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. And if you're not reading it closely, I wonder if you've ever recognized how much the, Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk is actually describing what will happen at many of your colleges and universities this weekend. Right? Like, I want you to know what's happening at the frat party. What's happening at some of the, I'm not saying every college party is this way. I'm just saying there are going to be hundreds of thousands of parties this year that are just like this. This idea of drunkenness, there's issues going on, drunkenness, of consent and power, right? You're making someone drunk and you're gazing upon them, of sexual immorality, of objectification of women. All of these things aren't modern things that popped up when we decided to start having fraternities. These are ancient things. These are old things. These are things that human beings have been doing to each other since the beginning of all the issues that are wrapped up in this one, this notion that I'm going to get you drunk and I'm going to look at you naked and I'm going to sexually take advantage of you or otherwise act in sexual immorality with you, this is something that is ancient as humans themselves. And I want you to know that God proclaims over this kind of wild party, sexual debauchery culture, he proclaims woe to you. Woe to you who do that. Woe to you who think that's okay. Woe to you who are okay with this. Woe to you who think this is an acceptable way of living. Let me put it this way to you, that God hates immorality. He hates immorality. I want you to know that God lays down laws, commandments, ways he wants human beings to live and operate with one another. And that we do not get to shrug those off. We do not get to laugh at those. We don't get to push those to the side without bothering the heart of God. Listen, I want us to understand that God expects something out of your moral life. I, I see all that's so popular right now to post this idea of God. This is like God doesn't care. God's not judging. God's not angry. No, like God cares about the way you operate. He cares about the way you behave. 
Listen, I want you to know that God hates immorality and that God calls his people to respond to immorality with this word, holiness, holiness. I want to talk to you about this word, holiness, because again, the message of the Bible is clear. God hates immorality, and the response that is demanded out of you is the response of something called holiness, that you would live holy. The word holy means to be set apart, to be morally upright, to be living a life that honors and glorifies God and submits to him. Listen, I want you to hear me tonight. Holiness is not an outdated thing. I think for some of you, you hear holiness and that sounds like something your grandmother would talk about. It sounds like something from like fundamentalist religion 150 years ago. It sounds like this strange thing that you've never thought about, but you need to know that holiness is not an optional part of your life. It's not an outdated thing. Let me challenge another group of you. Holiness is not a conservative thing. And just as I challenged my brothers and sisters here in the room and here online, that that for some of you, you've discarded something because of your political beliefs. Um, For some of you who are more on the liberal side, you've seen holiness as just an opportunity for conservative or right-wing Christians to control your music or the movies you watch or the shows you watch or the language you use. And so holiness has just become something you kind of avoid and you don't want to talk about and you don't like because you think that's just like what narrow fundamentalists do. But I want you to know you discard the idea of holiness at your peril. God calls you to it. He cares about it. Like if you lean left and if you're here and you're like, I just don't like what conservatives have done with the word, reclaim the word. Reclaim it to mean the kind of holiness we have before God where we live in love like Jesus and become more into the image and the likeness of the Son. Like if you're here tonight and you've just kind of had an aversion to the word holiness, I just want to ask you to search your heart if your aversion is actually to holiness or if your aversion is to someone who sinned against you in the name of holiness. Like, I want to call you toward holiness tonight. Because listen, holiness is not an outdated thing. Holiness is not a conservative thing. Hear me on this. Holiness is a Bible thing. It's a Bible thing. And if we are going to be Bible-believing Christians who love the Lord and walk with Jesus and try to serve him and be a faithful church in our generation, we are going to have to care about holiness. What does that mean? It's going to actually matter what we do with our bodies. That our sexuality actually matters. It's going to actually matter what words come out of our mouth. I cannot tell you how many Christians have told me that God knows my heart, so it's okay if I use foul language or vulgar jokes or racist comments, and I want you to know God does care what comes out of your mouth. It's a holiness issue. I have always stood up here when it comes to movies and TV shows and social media that I'm never going to draw the line for you. My fear is that some of you have no line, though. So there's nothing you've ever watched and just gone, you know, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who loves God, I just can't watch this anymore. Holiness is going to affect every area of our life, how we treat our moms, how we talk to our friends, how we love and serve those around us. Holiness is a deeply biblical issue. And I want to be clear on this, that if the scriptures are right, where it says that those of us who walk with Jesus are being formed into the image and the likeness of the Son, in other words, we're being made more holy, then this statement is true, that if holiness is not your mission, then Jesus is not your master. If holiness is not something you're after in your life, then you're not becoming more like Jesus. If you think it's irrelevant that you live a holy life before God, if you think it's irrelevant that your behavior actually matters to God, if it is not your mission, if you're not going, until I go to be with Jesus, I'm going to try to be more like him, and when I fail in holiness, I'm going to repent of it, then Jesus is not your master. Listen to me, I want you to know this, that holiness is an essential word that we discard at our peril. For some of you, holiness has never been part of your vocabulary. I want to call you toward that because the clear call of God on your life, the clear message that demands a response is that you forsake immorality in your life and that you pursue holiness. Here's the final, the fifth and final woe that we'll look at tonight. It says this, woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone, wake up. What's being referred to here is of course the ancient practice of idolatry of carving out of wood or stone or bricks, some kind of idol, some sort of thing. And then it says here, woe to him who says to that idol they've carved, come to life, or to a lifeless stone that they've carved, wake up. All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, we see this warning against idolatry. And I want you to understand that if it's true that God loves you, then it's also true that God hates idolatry. God hates it. 
God hates idolatry. He hates that people would worship images of wood and of brick and of stone. He hates that people would do that. And hear me, he hates that you would worship the idols that you bow down to. The idols of fame and sex and money and power and approval. The idols of you being accepted or the idol of you having status in this world. Like whatever that thing is that draws you, God hates idolatry. And God calls his people to respond to idolatry with worship. Worship of the one true God. Listen, I want you to know tonight the message is clear that God hates that you would put anything or anyone in the place that he deserves in your life. God hates that there would be anything or anyone in your life that you would want, desire, or orient your life around other than him. God hates idolatry. And the call that demands a response from you in your life is that you would be the type of individual who worships God and God alone, who orients your entire life toward who God is and who he says you are. So I want to be clear tonight that idolatry is not an ancient thing. Uh, like I hope at this point you have heard over and over and over again from this pulpit that idolatry is not some sort of ancient thing that we smirk at and think they were silly people, that we recognize that idolatry is alive and well in our world today, that we live in a world, we live in a culture, and human beings have always lived in a world and lived in a culture where there are other things we seek after other than God, other things we want more than God himself. Listen, idolatry is not an ancient thing. You need to know this. Idolatry is not a trivial thing. Like idolatry is not one little subject in the Bible that kind of pops up occasionally. Idolatry, in fact, one Old Testament scholar has put it this way, that idolatry is the central storyline of the Bible. And his point is this, that the great friction throughout all of human history has been this, will human beings worship and serve the creator or will they serve the created things? And every time I walk in sin, every time I turn toward my sin and turn away from my God, I'm saying my work, my value, my worship, my adoration is toward the created things rather than the creator who's blessed forever. This is the central storyline of the Bible, that God is turning the hearts of his people from the created order toward the creator himself. Finally, I just want us to be clear that idolatry is not an ancient thing. It's not a trivial thing. Idolatry is a Bible thing. And if we're going to be Bible-believing Christians who love the Lord and walk in obedience and submission to the Bible, we must be a people who forsake idolatry and instead choose to worship the one true God. It's a fascinating thing that all throughout the Bible, God commands his people to worship them. And this might actually sound to you, especially if you're new to the Bible, like kind of a vain thing or kind of a petty thing. Because if you demanded that someone else worship you, it would sound kind of vain, right? Like if you put up some Instagram post, you're like, hey, everyone, tell me how awesome I am we would judge you hard, okay? Like, like we would not think, like, ah, oh, that's so cool. We wouldn't. We, we, we would look down on you. And, and so it's easy to translate that to the Bible and just be like, God seems kind of desperate, right? He's like, please worship me. Please stop worshiping them. Start worshiping me. But here's what I want you to know tonight. I want you to know that God's command that we worship him is for our good. It's for our good. And here's what I, want, and here's what I mean by that. Um, it's not that God is somehow incomplete unless we worship him. But like God is God. God is glorious. God is worship. God is mighty. God is sovereign. God's good. God's command that we worship him, that we glorify him and him alone, that we honor him above all things is for our good. And why is that true? Because of this statement. And if you're taking notes tonight, write this down. It's because you become what you worship. You become what you worship. And our contention is this, that there is no one in this world, no one who has ever lived who does not worship. That worshiping isn't even a religious phrase. Worshiping is just this impulse we all have toward what we value, treasure, esteem, and seek after the most. So listen, imagine a person who wants money more than anything in this world. All they want is to be rich. All they want is to have money. All they want is to have all the possessions and all the money. Imagine that type of person where money is their God, their highest aim in this life. What does that person ultimately become? They become twisted up by money. They become this greedy person who's just been twisted up by the value and the enticing nature of money, right? Like if you've ever met someone who's just greedy and all they care about is getting rich for themselves, that's not the type of person you want to be around. Think about the type of person who cares about power and power alone. So it's the person at your company or your organization who just seems to be like moving and maneuvering so they can get the top spot. All they want is power, political power, or social power, or, or societal power, and that's all they want. 
If you become what you worship, that person's just going to become this embodiment of the manipulative, powerful, oppressive hand that we all see. I want you to think about the type of person whose God is sex. They never say no to their sexual appetite. They always say yes to their sexual appetite. They give in over and over and over again. And some of you know these people. It's let them down a road where the greatest person who suffers is them. It twists them up. We become what we worship. Can I tell you this tonight? If what you worship, if what you want more than anything else is the approval of everyone else in this world, you'll actually become like everyone else in this world and be miserable for it. Like, listen, when God says... When God tells us to worship him and him alone, it's because God knows this is true, that you become what you worship. The reason you're told to forsake idols and worship God alone is that when you worship God, you become more like God. You become more godly, more loving, more gracious, more good, more kind, more self-controlled. You become like God when you worship him. Listen to me, I need us to know this, that worship is an essential word. It's an essential word. And we discard it at our peril. So again, there are three things God hates that we looked at tonight. The three things God hates are injustice. And he calls every single person in this room or listening online to respond to injustice in this world with justice. To care about the well-being of image bearers. To care about the society. To care about the world. To respond to injustice with justice. Listen, the second thing God hates is immorality. He hates sin. He hates that you would walk in rebellion against him and calls you instead to walk in a holiness toward him. And then finally, God hates idolatry. He hates that you would worship and become like anything else in this world other than God himself. And what God calls us to respond to is to respond in worship. We see a beautiful example of what worship leads to here in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14. This is a famous verse. It says it this way. It says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. This is this beautiful prophecy that says, listen, God is going to do his work in this world. And then this is a promise, a future promise, that there will come a day where the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. This word glory of the Lord in Hebrew is the kavod of Yahweh. Kavod is the sense of uh, of God's glory. It's almost like a weight. It's a presence. It's a substance. In other words, there will come a day where our sense of God in this world Our experience of God in this world will be like the waters covering the sea. I don't know if you've ever been in the sea, but there's water everywhere, okay? And this is the promise, that there is coming a day where Jesus Christ will return in glory, that day of the Lord where Christ returns, where God makes all things new, and we will live in an eternal reality where you can't get away from the presence of the Lord any more than you could get away from wetness when you were in the ocean, okay? This is what's coming. There is coming a day. And here's what that tells me. Like if this day is actually coming, if I actually believe that this kind of day is coming, that Habakkuk, the prophet, is promising us that there's going to come a day where the glory of the Lord subsumes everything else in my life, I don't want to live for anything less than the glory of God. Like, let me put it to you this way. So this last Monday, t- took a day off work uh, and, and had some family in town and got an opportunity to take my daughter to the beach. Um, and so my daughter and I go to the beach, and I want you to know that when we go to the beach, we do not get anywhere near the water, all right? We don't touch it, we don't look at it, we don't see it. We do one thing, and that is build sandcastles over and over and over and over again. That's what we do. We build sandcastles. So my daughter's sitting there and she's got her bucket, but then I just gotta confess something about my daughter right now. She's three years old, she's adorable, she's cute, she's the light of my life. She is terrible at building sandcastles just real bad. Like she doesn't pack it in real well, she dumps it over. It's kind of, it's just not, she's not the best at it. And so I was thinking about this this week because I see her sandcastle and it's kind of like, almost like the you tried trophy, right? But, but, but then I started looking up like the greatest sandcastles ever built and I saw stuff like this. Like how epic is this? And then this, like this is amazing. Or, or the last one, I'm just seeing these amazing sandcastles going like this is like sandcastle perfection. But then you think about it for a second and you think about the fact that my daughter builds these really lousy sandcastles. And someone built this really epic sandcastle. But the irony of either sandcastle is this, that the tide is going to come up and wipe away every sandcastle, right? So it's like whether it's my daughter's piddly little sandcastle or this epic creation, either way, it's gone. In a blink, it's gone. And here's what I think of. 
I think some of us have looked around this world and gone, okay, I don't want to build a little sandcastle of my life. I want to build a big, epic, wonderful sandcastle. And so you look around the world and you see people who haven't made a lot of money or haven't been famous or haven't been powerful or haven't found some kind of success as you defined it. And so instead of saying, you know what, that's not actually my standard of success, you've just built this epic sandcastle. But I want you to know if you live in the kind of way where you're trying to build for your glory and your fame and your life and your reputation and your deal, it's all about you. I want you to know that whether or not you are successful and build a sandcastle like this, or whether you are unsuccessful and you build a sandcastle like my daughter made, either way, there is coming a day where the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters of the sea and your reputation, your kingdom, your glory, your fame will be washed away. None of it will matter. If you live for you, if you live for what you care about most, eventually there will come a day where none of that matters. And I'm here tonight to plead with someone just four words. Don't waste your life. Don't waste it. God's given you one life. Do not waste it building your own kingdom, your own glory, your own fame, your own majesty, because there's coming a day where the tide of God's glory will come up and all of our sandcastles will be washed away. All of them. And I want us to build the kind of lives, to do the kind of ministry, to live the kind of life where we respond to God in obedience, where God's glory is something we're contributing to, being about, so that it won't be washed away. And how do we do that? One last verse I want to look at in this chapter. It tells us in verse 4, a very famous verse. Here's how you live a life that is not wasted. Here's how you live a life that will matter into eternity. It says this in Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. It says, the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. The righteous will live by faith. This is quoted in the New Testament in Romans and Galatians and Hebrews. It's this epic text of the New Testament that's trying to convince us that the way we get right with God has always been through faith. The way to live the kind of life that is pleasing to God and that will last into eternity is by faith. And I think this is important for us to see. Let me, let me just speak to you, especially if you grew up in church. Some of you who grew up in church have come to believe that the Old Testament teaches that you have to earn your salvation by your works, but the New Testament teaches it's by faith. And I want you to know that is a misunderstanding of the Bible. Because here we are in the Old Testament, the book of Habakkuk, and how does someone become, how does the, someone become righteous? They live by faith. Faith has always been the grounds for salvation in the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, we are saved by trusting in Jesus, throwing ourselves on God, and having faith in who he is. Right, let me show you what that means and where this verse pops up in the New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 16. Here's what Paul writes, and he's about to quote this verse. He says this, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Right, like in other words, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. The word gospel is the Greek word euangelion. It literally means the good news. Paul is not ashamed. He's not embarrassed of the good news because here's the good news of Jesus to those of you who have never heard it. The good news of Jesus is that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture and was raised for the third day on the third day according to the scriptures. What that means is that all of us were sinners before a holy God, forsaken, fallen from God, far separated off from him. And Jesus Christ comes into this world. He bears the punishment for our sins on the cross. So that on the cross of Jesus, Jesus takes your place. He is your substitute. He dies on the cross, bears your punishment for your sins, and then raises on the third day to show that death has no hold on him and death has no hold on you if you trust in him. The good news of the gospel is that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be made right with God, adopted into his family, entered into this kingdom of God where God is going to make all things new. The good news of Jesus is that because of the final accomplishment of Jesus on the cross, all of us can enter into this reality that Habakkuk describes when he says there will come a day where the glory of the Lord fills the earth as the waters cover the sea. We will enter into that. He says, this is the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. It is the power of God that brings salvation. In other words, I want you to understand that you are saved not on your own power, not on your own strength, not on your own might. You are saved by the power of God. God saves you. God rescues you. 
God come and gets you. He saves you from your sin. He saves you from your idolatry. He rescues you from that. And he brings you into a new life for everyone who believes. He says, first the Jew. But like in other words, he says, first for the Jewish people that Jesus came up through. Jesus was a Jew. And then to the Gentile. And in case you don't know Bible language, Jews describe Jews and Gentiles describe everyone who's not Jew. So what does this mean? This is the power of salvation for everyone. This is how we are rescued. This is how we are saved. And then Paul goes on in the next verse to quote that verse from Habakkuk, saying in verse 17, it says, for the gospel is the righteous, for, the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, for as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul looks back to the book of Habakkuk and says, how are we saved? How do we have an eternity with him? How does our life matter? How do we not waste our life? How does that happen? In the gospel of righteousness, where the righteousness, the moral character of God is revealed for his people. And he says, the righteous will live by faith. Here's what I want you to understand tonight. If you want your life to matter, if you want your life to not be swept away in history, if you want your life to matter for all of eternity, It happens not through your effort, not through your plans, not through your talent or skill or ability or wealth or influence or connections. If you want your life to matter, you must live a life of faith. This is the message of the Bible, and it demands a response. If you want your life to matter, you must live a life of faith. And if you want to live a life of faith, you respond to that message. It is not a message you can just ignore. Because if you ignore the message of the Bible and say, forget you, God, I'm going my own way, I'm doing my own thing, I don't need you, you will walk and eventually you will end up in a Christless eternity because you've gone your own way. See, it's a message that demands a response and it does not matter whether you think you've responded or not. You have, because if you've responded in faith and you have faith in Christ, your life lasts on unto eternity, your life is not wasted. But if you decide, forget you, God, I want nothing to do with you, you will walk on into a Christless eternity. And I want some of you to respond to the message of the Bible tonight. I want you to respond in faith. I want you to have faith in the Son of God. I want you to have faith in Christ. Faith is not a blind leap. Faith is not believing something that you have no evidence of. Faith is you throwing yourself on someone or something that you believe can hold your life in their hands. And that's what I'm asking for you tonight. I want to call you to respond, and I want to call you to respond. A few chapters later in the book of Romans, Paul says this sentence, and this sentence is found all throughout the Bible, and here's the invitation for us tonight. It's that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want you to know that this word, it begins with this word, everyone. I want you to know that the type of people who can come to God is contained in this word, everyone. Everyone. Everyone including people who grew up in Christian homes but wandered away, including you if you've never really known faith or never really known Christ and you've never really known what it means to trust him. Everyone, there is no person in this room, there is no person listening to this video right now that will not be received by God if they come to him. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It says everyone who calls, who cries out to God. Listen, there's only one type of person that God can't save. Do you know that? The only type of person that God will not save is the person who doesn't think they need saving. God will save everyone who thinks they need saving. When we cry out to someone, when we call out to them, it's because we believe we need help. When you can't figure something out, when you call someone for help with an assignment or with a project or with something going on in your life, you cry out to them because you can't do it on your own. And tonight, I want to invite some of you for the first time in your life to cry out to God, to say, I can't do this on my own. I want to live by faith. I want to trust you, God. I want to call on your name. It says, we call on the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus. We call on the name of the Lord. This word Lord in the Greek language is the word kurios. Kurios means king. It means master. I want to be clear that to call out for Jesus to save you is not just that Jesus saves you and then you move on with your life. It's that you call out to Jesus that he would save and he would rescue you. And then your entire life is laid down and you pick up him instead. To call on Jesus as Lord is to say, you're in charge. You call the shots. I'm walking with you. I'm walking in justice. I'm walking in worship. I'm walking in holiness. My life is yours now. To call on the name of the Lord is to cry out to Jesus. From time to time, I'll hear preachers say something like this. They'll say that it's time for you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Can I just remind you of something tonight? 
You don't make Jesus the Lord of anything. He already is the Lord of everything. He's already the sovereign king of the universe, the resurrected Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will return in glory one day to judge the living and the dead. And to call on his name is to confess that that is so, to cry out that it's so, to align your life with Jesus. It says everyone, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Like the great promise of the Bible isn't cry out to Jesus and then live a really good life. And if you're good enough, you get into heaven. No, I want you to know that the kingdom of heaven invades your life in the moment you call out. Because it's not that you might be saved or could be saved or should be saved. It's that you will be. This is the invitation for you tonight. And I'm going to invite in just a moment for some of you to respond to this invitation. And why do I want you to respond to this invitation? Because the message of the Bible is clear. And it demands a response. It demands that you respond to it. And what is the message that we've seen throughout this whole thing? That God cares about worship and God cares about idolatry and God cares about justice and injustice and immorality and holiness. What is it ultimately that God cares about? What does God care about? And the answer that we've seen through the thread of this whole thing is very simple. God cares about people. God cares about you. And someone here has been convinced that God never cared about you and doesn't love you and doesn't know you. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ hung and died on a cross so that you could have a relationship with him. God died for you. And I want to invite you to respond to that message tonight. So across this room, I want to invite you to just do one simple thing with us. Would you just close your eyes and bow your head? Just all across this room. And the reason I do this is, is quite simple. Um, I want you to know that the decision to respond to the gospel, the decision to respond to the message of God is not something anyone else in your life can do. If you're sitting next to your friend, they can't respond for you. Your mom can't respond to, for you. Your best friend, your roommate, they can't respond for you. Only you get to respond. And the most important thing will be what you did with this. So I have you close your eyes and bow your heads for that reason. And then I want to pray a prayer with you if tonight's your night. If you're saying, you know what, I need to call on the name of the Lord. I've been far from God. I don't know Jesus. I haven't trusted in him. Maybe I once walked with him, but I know that I've fallen away. And I need to cry out to Jesus that he would save and rescue me. I want to lead you in this prayer tonight. So just pray in the silence of your heart. Say, Father in heaven, I confess that you created me. I confess that you are God. I confess that I've fallen short of your glory. Tonight, God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. And I trust in your son, Jesus. I call on the name of the Lord that I might be saved tonight. God, I give all I know of me to all I know of you. God, rescue me. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your child. Give me a home in heaven forevermore. And all across this room with every eye closed and head bowed. I just want to ask you a simple question. If tonight's the night you're calling on the name of the Lord to be saved, would you just open your eyes and look straight at me? If tonight's your night, it's not all of you. But if tonight's your night, and listen, if you've done this a million times, you don't have to do this right now. But if you're saying, you know what? No, I'm not playing around anymore. I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to live this way. I want to live for Jesus. I want to lay down my life. and just look straight at me. I see you. I see you across this room. Let me just ask some questions if you're looking at me right now. And again, this isn't all of you. Tonight, are you saying you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that you might be right with God? If so, just nod your head yes. Awesome. Now across this room, if you're looking at me, um, like are you confessing that you believe Jesus is king? He's in charge. Like he, he's in charge of your life and you're gonna stumble and fall, but like he's in charge now. If so, just nod your head yes. It's awesome. It's awesome. Um, I just believe this. Like, with all my being, you call on the name of the Lord, you're saved. Like, the kingdom of God comes into you. The Holy Spirit is around you. And you may not feel different right now, but yet God is accomplishing his promises in your life. And we as a church, we as a community, just want to, like, celebrate with you, be with you. So, like, on the one hand, like, this is a personal decision where, like I said, no one else can make this decision. But if you're looking at me right now, I actually want to ask you in a moment to do something brave. Because deciding to know Jesus is a personal decision, but it's not a private one. It's not something you keep to yourself. And so in just a moment, I want to ask some of you to stand across this room. And it's not to embarrass you. It's not to shame you. It's not even because standing saves you. No, Jesus saves you. He's already done it. 
And I want to give us a chance to remember that Jesus saves and give you a chance to stand in this moment and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So all across this room, if you've been looking at me right now, if tonight's your night, would you on three just stand to your feet so we can celebrate with you? One, two, three. Would you stand up with me right now? And the rest of us, we can look around. You can stand up still if you want to. It's awesome. It's awesome all across this room. Praise the Lord for that. That's so good. Listen, God is on the move and God saves and God rescues and he redeems and everyone who calls on his name is saved. Well, let me speak to those of you who are standing. Um, we have a little thing. Um, we don't want anything from you right now. We're not gonna like take anything from you. We just want something for you. Um, there's a little number on the screen here. You can text uh, if you want to, to get some more information about how we can help you follow Jesus. Again, this isn't like for us to get your credit card. It's nothing like that. It's just like we want to give you information. We want to give you resources. We want to come alongside you. Like this is not the finish line. This is just the beginning of you being a part of what Jesus is doing in this world because none of us want to waste our life. None of us want to live that way. We want to live a life that matters. The old poet said, one life, it will soon pass. Only those things done for Christ will last. That's what we want for your life. So as you stay standing, would the rest of us stand with these folks who responded to the goodness of God tonight, to the gospel of God tonight? And would all of us remember that we are called to worship God and God alone? We are called to cry out to Jesus. We are called to worship the God of the universe. We are called to declare with one voice that Jesus rescues and he saves and he forgives and he redeems. He is the good God of the universe who will never leave. He will never forsake us. So tonight, let's pray. Let's worship. Let's believe that what God started in this room, he will finish in all of eternity because our God is faithful. Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. We believe that you saved. I thank you for people responding tonight and I thank you for the faith of the men and women in this room. God, would you continue to fan the flame of that faith? May our lives not be wasted. May we respond to the good news of Christ in every moment, in every way. Hear our worship now. May it be pleasing to your ears. We pray this in the saving name of Jesus and all God's people said, Lord, you came to my rescue at night. I want to be where you are. Yes, I call and you answer.
guys we're gonna keep worshiping um yeah <laughs> yeah I just I <laughs> we feel um yeah that we're not done yet because I think there's so much that has happened in this room tonight just for those of us who have walked with the Lord but the, for those of you who are starting to walk with the Lord tonight um our testimony is powerful um the blood of the lamb is powerful basically it just means the blood of Christ is powerful that that salvation comes, um, yes, for that saving day where we get to see God on the next side of eternity, but that also invites heaven to earth now. And I just want to encourage you guys tonight, um, transparently, came in tonight not feeling, not feeling it, not feeling God, not feeling good, but it doesn't mean he's not good. Um, and right now, I think I'm being invited uh, to remind myself where God has been in my life that my testimony is still good and powerful and true because Christ has been in it. So if you're having a hard time tonight, or if you're even, if you're in a good place, worship for the person next to you, but declare the goodness of God because he is Lord over all. He's Lord over every area that feels hard or difficult, every area the enemy would love to take from you tonight that you know what, he just can't have in the name of Jesus. So we're gonna declare our testimony to God before one another and before Christ. Um, I don't even know that's what I needed, but this is what I need in this moment. So I'm going to invite you in, in the presence of God, to once again remind your soul who God is. He is not done yet, and there's so much more to your testimony. So let's worship.
Thanks for continuing to worship. And um, truthfully, that's something we get to do going from this place tonight. Um, as we were reminded, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. That starts now. As the water is covered with the sea. So as we go from this place, just know that's what you carry as you testify to the glory of God, of who Jesus is. And sometimes it starts testifying back to yourself. So we love you guys. Thank you for gathering here. We'll see you next week. Thank you.